understand? And I'm going to um, ask everyone to briefly introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, let's just go through the agenda first. And I'll introduce myself now. I'm, I'm Stephanie Frederick, the chair of the Land Use Committee, and I'm a member of the BDNA board. And we have with us a guest speaker, Gail Keeley, who's going to talk to us about the history of the Brentwood Darlington Community Center. And uh, this is of interest to us because we're, we're finding a lot of mystery in the past and we're not sure who owns what or what our responsibility is or relationship. So we're going to begin exploring those things. And then I want to go on to talking about um, uh, what I'm calling community beneficial development. Uh, you know, if we want to have some nice development that is perhaps uh, uh, makes nice use of a place like the strip mall at the corner of 52nd and um, Flavel, uh, we need to um, make connections and acquire knowledge and um, and figure out what um, what we want to do. So we'll look. We'll talk about that at around 7:30 or whenever. Gail is, um, has finished telling us uh, the history. And then we have a couple of updates on street safety uh, in Brentwood Darlington. Also uh, update and some corrections uh, regarding uh, the, our air quality uh, matter, our, our connection with Portland Clean Air. And if there's time, I'll give you an update on uh, trees and parks, otherwise uh, next time. Uh, and if there's any other business that people want to raise, then we can bring that up at that time. So uh, would you quickly uh, uh, name yourselves and, in, and give a quick introduction to yourselves and then we'll begin uh, talking with Gail. So Maria, start with you. Uh, sure. My name is Maria. I've been living in this neighborhood for about four years now and I've been with the Land Use Committee for roughly a year. Um, Oh, pronouns she, her, and uh... Okay, that's great. All right, Pam, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, Pam Hodge. I'm a board member for with Brentwood Darlington, and I also represent the neighborhood on the Southeast Uplift Coalition. Uh, I was born and raised in Brentwood Darlington, and I live on the very southern edge on Harney Drive, just up the hill from Precision Cast Park. <laughs> it is polluter. Okay. All right. And uh, Gail, you want to introduce yourself quickly? I'm Gail Kiley, and I have feedback. That's okay. We have your face and your voice. <laughs> We're so happy to see you. And <laughs> All right. Gail is going to be the person. Gail's a member of the board, and she's lived here a long time. She's going to talk to us about the history of the uh the community center, but we're going to Joanna. How long have you lived in the neighborhood now, did you say? Well, I, I bought my home last October. So yeah, but, there's a few, coming up on six months. But that's Excuse the um, home across the street that you're gonna move into. Yes, and it's it's on the car, it's it, the intersection of Southeast Rural and 72nd. So um, it's brand new, some renovations are ongoing, but it's gonna be a, I, I'm really excited to move in there. Oh, very good. And we're excited to have you. Thank um, you. But before, but have you been in Brentwood Darlington for a while? For, for a, little, a, a year. I've been renting for a year. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Um, right. And previously I was in the Northwest area renting as well. So this is my first home and very exciting. Oh boy, now that is exciting. Okay, well, we're excited for you. Uh, Thank you. Okay, so Autumn, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I had to figure okay. out how to unmute. Um, I am a community member here. I too live right up the street from Precision Cast Parts up the hill, so we're probably neighbors. Uh -huh. um, Pam. And um, I've been here four years. That's it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Autumn. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you. All right. Very fine. All right. Let's um Let's get going with, with Gail. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, to address four main points. Um, 
I think uh, I still would like to share screen and bring up Mary Davis's history there. She's got a couple of paragraphs on the the background of um, of the the Brentwood Darlington Community Center that we could look at quickly and then um, Gail can react to that and uh, tell her own story. So why don't we do that? Okay, I'm clicking share screen at my end. Okay, this will show, stop the other share screen. Yes, I want to continue. And uh, all right, very fine. Okay, share. That's a whole lot of sharing. So it is a lot of sharing. Okay, fine. All right. So um, uh, for the for um, uh, Joanna, you may uh, you may not know where the community center is. It's uh, it's on 62nd Avenue, and it's right next to the big Brentwood Park and uh, Lane Middle School. Just so you know where that is between Duke yes. and Flavelle. Okay, fine. Yes, I do. Yes. Okay, very good. All right. So Mary has says that in 1995, an independent nonprofit corporation was created to carry out the goal of building a community multi-purpose multi-service center for the BD neighborhood. And this had been a high priority in the BD neighborhood plan adopted by the city of Portland. And Pam has found a copy of that. Uh, so um, uh, well, we can take a look at that one day. This nonprofit was called the Brentwood Darlington Community and Family Resource Center. Uh, let's see, the, the former county commissioner, Tanya Collier was the spark behind the corporation's creation. She was a former resident of a neighborhood. The, um, the, this board, the BDCC board, and that's the nonprofit, had representatives from uh, uh, Commissioner Collier's office, the city's Bureau of Housing and Community Development, Lane Middle School, and the community. Community representation included members of the BD Board Neighborhood Association and other local stakeholders. The land is owned by the Portland Public School District. And then a 90 year lease was signed in 1995, but I'm not sure exactly what that means, between whom. Uh, between whom and the school district. I, the building was owned by this nonprofit and the building officially opened in 1997. Then the nonprofit was dissolved. But before it dissolved, the, the, the staff of the nonprofit asked Impact Northwest to take on the responsibility for operating but not necessarily owning the center. Um, no, Northwest was considered to be the best um, target or, or entity for taking over the building because um, uh, the building had been, part of it was to specifically designed for Northwest's or IMPACT's child development program. Mary says, um, if ownership was transferred to IMPACT Northwest, it likely happened when the parent of the BDCC was dissolved. I don't know what that means, the parent of the BDCC. Do you, Pam? You're, you're muted. I don't know either. I, I think they just mean the, the, when, when the actual nonprofit was dissolved. OK, fine. All right, so now um, let's go to Gail, because Gail believes that the, we, that the BDNA owns the building. And indeed, we do seem to have some responsibilities for it and some access privileges. But um, um, we're, we, we need to verify all these things. So um, Gail, why don't you tell us what you recall from beginning with the construction and the input of ideas. You know, you were telling me early that, earlier that um, as a board member of the BDNA, you suggested features for the, um, the center. So why don't you go ahead and talk about that? Yeah, we, oh my goodness, this feedback is going to kill me. See if I can get further away from the computer. Because you can't hear me on the computer. We can hear you fine. How's this? Okay, that's good. Is that a little better? That's yeah. a little better. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, we used to meet at Lane Middle School. And we we talked about building a community center for a couple of years before we finally found a commissioner and people who would get it the ball rolling. Um, yeah, they started construction 95 or 96. It didn't open until 97. It took a while to build. So you were um, there, but it was actually being constructed. But I was living in Medford in 96 and 97. I didn't get oh. back till 97. I see. And we had a fabulous new community center. Nice. And so do you remember the creation of this nonprofit um, corporation? Um, yeah, as far as I know, the neighborhood association is in control of the community center and Impact Northwest just operates it. Uh-huh. And, and, and back, oh, so when this um, nonprofit was, um, was formed, you were in Medford at that time? Yeah. I see, okay, all right. Now, um, Mary Davis believes that the land is owned by the Portland Public School District. It was, but then it um, got transferred over to Portland Parks and Rec. But Portland Maps shows the land to be owned by the school district. It's weird. That, it's possible. But well, we, as we, far as I know, I'm, Portland I'm, Parks and Rec I'm not controls with you. I'm pretty just... much all of the community centers. OK. But the building, can a building be owned separately from the land on which it stands? Yeah, it's its own entity. Uh huh. And so, as far as you know, it's owned by Portland Park. The building is owned by Portland Parks and Rec, and right. Impact leases the building. Hello. No. I. Oh my goodness! This feedback. Um. That's a good question. Okay. The building is on Portland Parks and Rec land, and we own the building. Okay. And so Impact Northwest has a long-term lease with right. Portland Parks and Rec, you believe? I think so, yeah. Okay. And so um, you were telling me earlier today that um, in the early years of this, of the 2000s, um, the BDNA used the community center quite oh, a yeah. bit. Do you, so do you remember what, what kinds of things went on there? Meetings and um, parties um, and what? No. <laughs> and you said that we, we had-, I know we uh, had okay. community events there. Uh-huh. Like national night out or the, Trick or treat thing, or well, trick or treat's new, but National Night Out we uh -huh. used to do in different locations all over the neighborhood. We had it in a church one year, uh, Brentwood Park, Harney Park, uh, Hazel Time Park when it opened, and then the community center. Okay, and you said we had a little office in the building? We did, little teeny tiny closet office. That's between, between the, the main office and the kitchen down the hall. So that's interesting. It'd be nice to have the use of that again. Um, yeah, we have right to find now, out who has it now. Uh huh. We never see it, the door opened or anybody there, but of course we're there in the evening, so. True. Um, okay, so you were telling me that in 97 and 98, uh, the um, BDNA was behaving badly and hold, having closed. Yeah, meetings. there was a whole board of 
I don't even remember who they were, but they never came back. They, they pretty much used the neighborhood association as their own whatever, something. And so you attempted to uh, attend a meeting and, and were shut out? Pretty much, yeah. And do you, do you know what that group was uh, trying to accomplish? Whatever it was, they didn't do it because we stopped them. I see. And then you were telling me that on a different subject that Northwest Impact tried to sell the building. Yeah, it wasn't a very successful try, but yeah. Because Northwest Impact staff believed that Northwest owned the building. Yeah, they don't. And, and they admitted that. They do now. But that was when they were changing their name. And that could be why they had to change their name. Oh, so it was called Portland Impact. Yeah. And then but that would have been, uh, it says here, the, the nonprofit staff asked Portland Impact, now Impact Northwest, to take on the ability, the responsibility for operating but not necessarily owning the center, but that right. would have been back at the turn of the century of this century though. So you're talking about about 10 years ago, right? Uh, 15 maybe? Uh-huh. Oh, probably closer to 20. Oh, so right, ar oh, right around the turn of the century. So Impact was asked to operate the building and then turned around and wanted to sell it? Yeah. Well, they weren't making as much money as they thought they were going to. Renting out for events and stuff. They didn't have the program programs going then that they have now, whatever they are. No, they do now, but at the time they didn't. Okay. And so, um, you, you said that uh, one of the, the the features of the building that used to be used as the, the fireplace, is a gas fireplace? Yep. Which is now- Now it has a lockbox on it. Does anybody ever use it to your I knowledge? used to. But now, do now, they- Now nobody can unless you have a key. Do people borrow the key or rent it or something? I don't even know where the key is. I see. And so to your knowledge, do we have any, um, any documents that, that specify what our relationship is with impact? Because I know that um, when I first arrived or a year later or something, we paid at least half of the cost of refurbishing the, the floor right. in the big room. So Chelsea seemed to know that we had that responsibility. Right. But I'm wondering what she based that on. That's a good question. I know there has to be documentation somewhere. So maybe we start with Chelsea. Maybe there are some buried documents somewhere. That we... And Mary, Mary Davis might know something. Uh-huh. Yeah, she said if, um, <clears throat> Well, yeah, we can we can ask her. Because her letter is accurate. Uh huh. Oh, okay, that's good. Uh, yeah, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you whether you supported uh, what oh, yeah. she had to say. So and I wish Dick Hazeltine was still alive because he knows all of this. Right. Well, if we have the... Hancock might know something. Okay, we can ask Malcolm. All right. So, but we don't really know, we don't have before us in our hands paperwork that shows that the BDNA owns it. And what, why, I'm not sure that I understand why the BDNA would own it since it was, um, it was part of the nonprofit, but- Well, so are we. No, no, the BDNA was part of the nonprofit, but it was only part of it. I mean, Lane Middle School was part of it. Right. of housing and community development. Well, the, uh, let me take that back. The board had representatives from all of those um, entities. That's a little different. Yeah. Uh, 
from being the owner. Okay, so Mary says the building was owned by the nonprofit. Then she says, if ownership, if ownership was transferred to Impact Northwest, it most likely happened when the nonprofit was dissolved. So Northwest might own it. I don't think so. Okay, but at the time, at this moment, we don't have any documents in our hands to show who owns it. And um, Portland map shows that the parcel on which it resides, in which the building resides is owned by the school district. Right. But you dispute that, you think it's more likely Portland Parks. Or well, it was transferred over to Parks and Rec. Or at least the building, I'm, I'm sorry. Right. You're, you're saying the, the building, building is owned by, yeah. okay. Well, that's just one of the things that we're going to, um, to have to figure out. And um, one of the, um, one of the things that I think we, you know, we, we, we would like to establish a cordial relationship with Impact Northwest. I think right now it's a little bit distant and I wouldn't say formal because we don't really know what our responsibilities are or what our rights are, but um, we could probably have a, a warmer, closer, more information sharing kind of relationship where impact comes and talks to our board now and then and, uh, and tells us what's going on with its programming. And I know that um, impact would like to do something about finding someone who will maintain the grounds around the building. So that's another question that's, that's come up. If who's, who's responsible for um, keeping the trees pruned and the the ground the weeds pulled and the and the you know things raked up and and so on um, the driveway in repair I think these are all things that are up up in the air we just do not know but um, you have this recollection though that in the early years the the BDNA came and went and used the building more freely than it than it does now. Is that your right. sense? Okay. And so over time, we've lost, we lost the use of that office and uh, we do have one set of keys. Yeah, that, it was mostly weekends and evenings. Uh-huh, okay, I see. All right. So do you remember anything else from that time? What we used the, the um, community center for besides um, national night out was, um, did we have our board meetings there? Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh, okay. And, and anything else? Did, did we ever have any forums where we had speakers and so on as we've done recently? Frequently. Ah, okay, All right. Uh, okay, so um, what we need to do is, um, I'm going to be talking with Andy Nelson, the executive director of Impact Northwest, next week, and um, try to to put us on the path to um, a working relationship to see if um, if maybe you know there are certain things we might like to be able to use the community center for that we don't presently, uh, and maybe we can work that out with Impact. You know, I don't know. You know, we need to talk about what, what, what we would want to see happen with our community center. Um, in and in, in, and we know that Impact Northwest has a lease with somebody, and is offering these various uh, programs. We'd like to know what they are, but maybe there are some little gaps in between where we could um, have some access, that, um, but we'll see. There's a lot to think about and talk about, uh, about what, what we might want and, and again, then what we could gain. Um, but it would be nice to have that little office back because True. storing our stuff in a kitchen cupboard is, <laughs> um, you know, it's not, it's not the greatest. I mean, Chelsea made that happen. And oh, that yeah. That was a, a big advance, but maybe we can advance things a little teeny bit more. And um, so I think what we need to do is um, 
get documentation just so we understand what our our relationship to the building is and what rights we have and what right responsibilities and get that all in writing and have it in a place where it's easily findable you know by True. others uh, down the way so yeah, because uh, we should have better access well um and and maybe i mean you've told me about going to the the, the community center and just going right in and and uh and not having difficulty going in and out. And, and uh, I approach it in a much more timid way. And so <laughs> I, I, I don't get as far as quickly as you do, I guess. Um, but anyway, are there other people here? Pam, for example, would you have some questions you'd like to put to Gail? So Gail, I did a little bit of Googling on the um, community center and I found a document from Multnomah County where they had extended a bridge loan apparently to uh, the nonprofit. Do you recall anything? I, I know Tanya called your yep. spearheaded the effort, was a Multnomah County commissioner at the time. And Lisa Nato helped. Okay. So, so that's your recollection too, that Multnomah County put up at least some of the funding to build yes. this building. And do you know where any of the other funding might've come from? <laughs> no idea. So what I'm thinking is that when the nonprofit uh, was dissolved, there should have been some uh, record of that in the Secretary of State's office. Uh, oh. Perhaps they have in their archives the terms of the dissolution and who got the assets from the nonprofit that was in the process of dissolving. That's so, a great idea. Yeah. So. Hadn't thought of that. Yeah, because it, it, it has to be governed by legal documents somewhere. Right, right. Okay, and so Chelsea might have some documentation that she did buried in her files, and then Impact Northwest must have a copy of its own lease, which would be a revealing document too. And so we'll see if we can get a copy of that and see if we can't put together um, a, a picture. So I, I just like to know where we stand. And I'd like to know why Chelsea knows or how she knows that we were supposed to pay for half of the floor, rent, floor uh, refurbishment. That's I think we were trying to be nice. But I remember saying no, we, but that we were responsible for doing that. It's so possible. Could, yeah. But, but we'll, you know, we'll ask her, we'll talk to her and so on. Okay. Um, so what is, what is uh, your impression of our relationship with Impact Northwest right now, Gail? I think we could be better. I, I don't think anyone's made an effort. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we could be we could try bringing cookies or something. <laughs> it's always the answer. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Um, all right. So does anybody else have um, questions for Gail? No, I don't. I think that I'm my my questions are pretty much um, taken care of now. And I um, it's interesting. I just want to make one comment that Gail asked somebody at Lane Middle School, which what what parts of the property that Lane School is on belong to Lane School, and and they thought or or to you know Portland Public Schools, and um, and she thought that it was the whole area back to the um, the street, the, to 62nd, right? And along the dog park. Right. Um, just straight back from the school. And um, so that, that agrees with Portland Maps <laughs> uh, claim, but we never know. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Um, I don't have any more questions right now, Gail, but I'm sure that we will for the future. And thank you so much for- no I'm gonna mute my phone so I don't have feedback, but I'm gonna okay. keep joining the meeting. Okay, thank you so much for sharing um, this history with us. I really appreciate it. But, okay, so I am going to- um,
Uh, I want to bring up the next document, but first let's go back to our, our agenda, if we might. Is that okay, um, Maria? I'm going to stop share and close this, and you could put up the. Um, okay. So uh, in previous meetings, we've been talking about the strip mall that's at the corner of Flavelle Street in Southeast um, uh, 52nd and appears to be for sale. Although when we try to call the, the realtor or look at the website, we can't get calls back and we can't find any mention of this property at the realtor's website. So we don't really, we don't know what the story is just fully right now, but the, the, I went by the other day and the, the realtor sign is still up on the property. So there's something going on. But um, we've been talking about the potential for that property to be something really wonderful for the neighborhood. Um, for example, a three-story building where the upper two stories are consist of units um, that are um, affordable housing units and down below uh, is room for retail and um, for um, business incubation um, that may be even a little meeting room. Um, and, um, and so this is very appealing and we've started to look into it a bit. Um, we had Nick Sovey of the Rose Community Development uh, Corporation come and speak to us and after absorbing um, at least some of the information that he provided and then um, making a little stab at doing one of the things he recommended doing, I realized that it, we really need to have a lot of, of knowledge and uh, we need to build connections and we have to have uh, more people involved to make things happen as far as some community beneficial development is concerned. So what I'd like to show right now, um, uh, and, we, and we can talk about number C later, we're going to just talk about how do we develop the knowledge and connections that we need for um, making something out of a strip mall like the one at 52nd and Flavel, or you know a different one. So I'm going to go back to um, uh, my own screen share now and up this other document. Um, I'll try to fill up the screen so that my, my noisy background isn't in the way. Uh, we should uh, do some studying up. Those of us who are interested in bringing some community beneficial development to Brentwood Darlington, get start becoming familiar with the things that Nick Sovey recommended. And so I've got here, and I will send this document out to, um, to the land use mailing list, but I thought that we could start looking closely at these websites, Guerrilla Development, Mercy Corps, uh, Living Cully, Hacienda, CDC, Verde Northwest. And I see I, I managed to eliminate the Mercy Corps um, uh, uh, URL, but I'll, I'll, I will put it back in. Um, so I would um, urge you, you know, to look at one, you know, one or two of the websites per, I don't know, month, get really familiar with it. And in the meantime, I'm going to arrange to have some speakers come and address us. Uh, Pam has um, suggested that we have guerrilla development. I think that would be very exciting. They do really innovative kinds of things here in Portland. And Nick Sovi recommended that we have Mercy Corps talk to us. Um, it's possible that after my conversation with Andy Nelson, we might ask Impact Northwest Director Andy Nelson to um, address us, but um, probably that won't be necessary. We can 
reach back to see if we can get somebody from from Cully, maybe Hacienda Verde, um, and over time build knowledge. And we need to build community. We need to get others interested in what in um, in this kind of project, because if it's only one or two people, then we're it's not going to work. So what um, what do you think, Maria, for example, what do you think of approaching things in this way, learning, taking a year anyway to develop our knowledge and to have speakers come to us? It's, it's a great idea. I'm also still thinking, um, you know, we, we started when we first started talking about, wouldn't it be great to have a space for our community to come together and to do different things. And mm -hmm. I started looking into the community land trust a little bit and then I got sideways when I was like, hey, hold on, what's going on with the Brentwood Darling Community Center? And so this way it would be a little bit more organized. If I may, I would just suggest to maybe somehow get or involve, I don't know how, and this is probably always the tricky part, how we can get um, um, the need or the opinion or the desire of a broader, of our broader community, mm -hmm. you know, so it is not, us six seven eight nine ten people deciding this is what we're doing this is where we're going and this outreach is always so hard to do and it is already challenging to get enough people on board to help that i'm not sure i don't have a solution is i guess my point but that's the the that's my only concern if we do it that way and we just heads down into the books and you know we pick the speakers and we pick this and that at some point we have to open it up for input from the community that we're trying to build something for. I, I agree. And I think that we, at that, um, as we start to um, look at these different websites, um, we need to talk about how to reach out to the community. Part, in part, we can um, hope to do it through the whole TGN planning process, I hope. And, um, and mm. we can learn from, living Cully, if we can have someone from Cully come down and talk to us and we can find out from them how they built um, community, that could be very helpful. But I agree, I mean, we, we can't just keep it to ourselves that we, two people or three people are going to study these websites and listen to these representatives. At the same time, we do need to um, uh, be reaching out and inviting people to join us and be part of this. Yes. Um, I just remembered, um, is, do you know anything that we, at some point, I guess half a year ago, or maybe a little bit longer ago, s uh, somebody from the neighborhood association from Lens came and talked to BDNA, I want to say, with a pretty um, well thought through approach for how to create community outreach as BDNAs, because that seems to be a point where most of the uh, neighborhood associations and different neighborhoods too are struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to remember that Lens came up with a plan and they visited different BDNA meetings presenting their model. Do you remember that that Lens project they did? I don't. I remember Robert Schultz talking about how the city doesn't do very good outreach to um, the neighborhoods, but I'm sorry, I, I'm drawing a blank on the Lentz plan itself. Pam, do you okay. remember? Of course you do. <laughs> no, well, I'm glad you remember the name. Robert Schultz actually was on the call with us uh, Tuesday night in the open house hosted by Commissioner Hardesty, where she was talking about her uh, developing vision for the new Office of Civic Life, which now reports to her. And so uh, Robert Schultz was pushing back again, you know, on uh, how to engage better uh, with the residents of Portland neighborhoods. And, you know, Commissioner Hardesty is very new as the commissioner in charge of the Office of Civic Life, but it sounded like she would be providing uh, more resources to the neighborhood associations and the coalitions under her watch. So I was very encouraged by that. Yes. I think we can look, uh, we've gone through a year or more of absolute turmoil uh, in terms of any assistance from the Office of Civic Life. 
Uh, and it's also thrown the Southeast Uplift Coalition into some disarray, I think, because of that. So I think better times are ahead. I don't think we have to do it all, you know, without help uh, from these other entities. And, and so I'm hopeful. But I, in answer to your specific question, Maria, I, I don't have any like written document from Lentz on what their approach is. I think they were as I recall, more pushing back on the way the city has been doing citizen engagement in recent years. Okay. All right, well, let's, um, I'm gonna uh, fix this document and, and put in the Mercy Corps URL and send it out to you. And for this next time around, I'd like us to, learn about living Cully. Okay, I'll rearrange this. And in the meantime, I'm gonna see if I can um, get a speaker or two in. And then um, I think I, I, that's a very good point. We need to think about outreach. And um, uh, I, like Pam, I am optimistic too that we're going to be getting more resources from the city. This is gonna be a long-term project. Brentwood Darlington is not a big activist neighborhood. And um, uh, if we wanna be like Cully, <laughs> we have to change our ways and embrace more people. And so we will try to figure this out and get outside resources too. So I will, I will add that as a section in this little plan and, uh, and this plan is eminently revisable, but I will send this out to you so that you can look at the living Cully. I think that's one of the most important things to look at right now, because Cully's done a wonderful job up there. Okay. All right. Um, for, uh, for another meeting, I'm going to stop sharing now and go back to the, um, or did anybody else have anything they would like to say while we're on this subject here? Pam, did you? Your hand is raised. Well, I've already spoken, but I just want to say one more thing. Uh, you might recall that a couple of years ago, uh, there was a neighborhood needs assessment and action plan put together by the urban uh, planning students at PSU. Uh -huh. Redwood Tarlington say our oh, name. Right. I found my copy right. last night. And there's really a step-by-step -step blueprint for how to do community organizing within Brentwood Darlington and uh, identifying who we should be reaching out to to form these strategic partnerships. So, I mean, I, I think at the time we were all extremely impressed by this document. And even though it was done a couple of years ago with a lot of community outreach, uh, I think it's still relevant today and Marty Stockton, the pr current project manager for the TGM grant was the uh, professional advisor to the students on this study. So it was extremely well done. And so I would suggest, you know, rereading that uh, document and the TGM uh, planning effort, you know, is just getting underway. So I think there will be some, some assistance through that uh, planning process as well for uh, public engagement and outreach to BDNA residents. Um, I have a comment. Oh, would it be okay? Sorry, I don't have my camera on. Um, one thing that could be a good idea is contacting an architecture firm like Sarah Architects that does urban planning and affordable housing and community outreach. Um, they did an affordable housing um, with community space below in the Jade District. And I know they engaged the entire community in that. So it may be helpful to have someone from an architecture firm speak perhaps. Well, um, I like that idea. We're so far from building design yeah. <laughs> or having yeah. connections or even knowing how to get attention from funding sources that right that we're not quite there, but down the road, yes, that, that'll be absolutely outstanding thing to do. Thank you for that suggestion. You're uh, okay, no, that's, that's great. I'll, I'll make a little note of that. And uh, what was the name of that firm? Sarah Architects. Sarah? S-A-R-A? S-E-R-A. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah.
Okay, and I will um, uh, add the uh, BD assessment and action uh, plan to this list and I'll put it up first and um, it may be, I'll post it as a Google document if, um, or else I'll direct people to the website, to the BDNA website where they can access it. So thank you, Pam, that's a great idea. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, I'm ready to uh, stop sharing. Have I stopped enough sharing? So that the, um, can you put up back, put up the agenda, Maria? Okay. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to talk about um, under 730C, we can save for another time. Uh, it's just simply that one of the land use committee's responsibilities is to um, appeal proposed development that is counter to thriving livability in our neighborhood. But I don't know exactly what we think is bad development. And um, uh, so we'll save that for another time, but it is something that that we should um, try to, to define or categorize because we do have special privilege with appeals to the city. Um, we can contest uh, proposed development and we don't have to pay this big fee that everybody else has to pay that to, um, to contest. So if I, I don't want to be passing up um, chances to counter bad development, but I need guidance on what we think that looks like. So we will talk about that in the future. And, uh, on the, let's go down to transportation very quickly. Um, we had good news from PBOT on the Southeast Flavel Drive speeding problem. They've responded to our, um, our protest that there's too much traffic and it's going way too fast and there's a lot of cut through traffic from Johnson Creek Boulevard. They've agreed to send a traffic engineer out to uh, evaluate the, the vehicle volume and speeds on Flavel Drive and asked us where the best places to measure are and we told them. And they're also, and this is big, they're putting us on a list of streets they're putting Flavel Drive on a list of streets that are eligible to receive um, uh, independent special funding for traffic calming devices like speed bumps or whatever, or stop signs, you know, pedestrian crossings, whatever it takes. And it's a big deal to get onto this list. We've wanted to be on this list for a long time, for years, and we're finally there. The um, the voters approved the, the fixing our streets 10 cent, reapproved the, the fixing our streets 10 cent gas uh, tax, and that funds these projects. Uh, we're going to get um, uh, some information in a couple of months about where we are on the list. But anyway, the advocates on Favel Drive who never let up um, on appealing to the city, um, we should thank them. It looks like we can. Uh, we, we have a chance now at restoring Flavel Drive to some neighborhood street status instead of a freeway cut through from, uh, from uh, Johnson Creek Boulevard. And then we had this other little problem uh, crop up now that school is beginning again. Um, last year, Peabot built a, an island, a refuge in the middle of 52nd Street, uh, right near the... Um, the northern part of Knapp Street that, that opens onto 52nd Street. And uh, it looked like it was something that was going to be part of the Greenway. And it has a little cut through so that you can ride your bike right through and so on, uh, or, or a wheelchair or whatever. And uh, we didn't pay much attention to it until recently when, um, a certain person who is uh, hosting our our, our <laughs> meeting tonight uh, found that you know her that to use this this uh, the center island and the uh, from what is supposed to be our greenway, which is Nap, 
the southernmost portion of Nap and the northernmost passion portion um, puts children in great danger because if you go east and you cross 52nd and then you want to go to the to the continuation of Nap, you have to ride against oncoming traffic and it's very dangerous. And uh, often there are cars parked at the corner. There's no sidewalk to get onto. And it's, it's, um, it's a very unsafe situation. And so we raised this problem with, with Peabot. And the reaction at first was, oh, everybody should know that this is just a pedestrian crossing. And we responded that Nap, Ogden Nap is going to be a greenway and it's always been already been treated as a greenway, which is for cycling by Portland um, because it's, you know, had all this slow street paraphernalia erected on it, as was done with all the other greenways in, um, in the city. And people have been encouraged to bike and walk on it. And so it is only logical to think that coming to the end of Nap and looking at 52nd, you see this nice crossing and you're on your bicycle and you know that you're, you've just been on the greenway, of course, you're gonna to try to use it for your bicycle. And I've seen other people using it since um, Maria called my attention to it. And uh, it's only logical. And so actually uh, they back down on, everybody should realize it's a pedestrian crossing. And they're now going to try to do something to, um, to make it safe for cyclists to use even before the Greenway project is officially painted and, and installed, which will probably not be for um, until the end of this year or, or maybe next year. So we do have their attention now. We, um, uh, we sent them the video of, of Maria and her son using the, using the Greenway and, and being, um, subject to dangerous conditions as they drove against, as they rode against the traffic. So Peabody is gonna figure something out to try to make it safer. Uh, I don't know what, but the bad news is that we just have to give up on getting the Greenway laid out along Ogden. It's not going to happen. And um, that's too bad, but we're, we're several years too late for, um, advocating for that. And so our, our pleas have just fallen on deaf ears. But people is going to send a representative to one of our board meetings to talk to us about what all these different projects are and what their relationships are to one another. Because apparently this, this, this pedestrian island in the middle of 52nd is absolutely not connected with the Greenway project that that Chelsea and others, uh, Leslie McKinney and others from BDNA fought for funding for. So it was erected independently of our Greenway project as part of a safe routes to school project that's separate from our, sa our safe routes to school project, which is the infill and the, and the Greenway. And so this is very confusing and it sounds like programs are not coordinating correctly because they slapped that crossing in and then people are trying to use it and they're not using it the way the planners want who are sitting at their desks in downtown. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, there's been a certain lack of coordination here and so anyway, somebody's gonna come and talk to us and we, and we can find out whether, what, what, um, what's, what the relationship is between these different projects that we see popping up around our neighborhood and our infill, our sidewalk infill and greenway project. And um, uh, so maybe, maybe they can come to the April meeting, uh, we'll see. And then, um, does anyone have a comment they'd like to make before I go into air quality? Okay, all right. Well, we'll wait for the, the speaker at the, at the board meeting and, and see what uh, Peabody has to, has to tell us. And I'd like to note when our sidewalks and greenway are going to be installed. 
officially because it's been quite a while um, since um, since the funding was approved. On the other hand, um, we've had COVID and also um, PBOT reeled a couple of years ago from loss of planners to Seattle and Los Angeles. And so I think that that hit them pretty hard. Anyway, we'll find out. To go on to air quality quickly, um, I had um, sent, recently sent a little notice to the board asking, saying that um, uh, uh, we're going to, um, uh, oh gosh, what, are, what did I say? <laughs> I said, I have two different, too much in my head go, going on right now. Um, <laughs> Gail is saying something in chat here. Um, I was suggesting that, um, that we signed um, Portland clean air letters that were not from individual neighborhood, neighborhoods back in 2019. And that's according to notes I had taken at the time, but apparently that's not accurate that we did in fact um, sign on to letters that were from specific uh, neighborhoods writing to their local polluters. So I apologize for that, that, that is not correct. The question of whether we want to um, assign any letters and continue a relationship with um, Portland Clean Air, we're going to bring that up in, in April. So we can have a nuanced discussion about what we may wish to do as far as signing individual letters directly with neighborhood associations and whether we want to have any continuing relationship with Greg Bourget, which is probably not a great idea but that will be on the April BDNA board agenda. And we'll, we'll, we'll uh, talk about it then. Okay, any questions on that? And let me see what, what you've written, Gail. Uh, oh, how many planners does it take for a sidewalk? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, uh, apparently um, more than we think, huh? And as a, a, a final um, item on trees and parks, uh, the people at Trees for Life Oregon have included BDNA in a grant proposal that they've submitted to uh, Portland Parks and Rec. If that proposal comes through, then we're gonna get some money to buy buckets uh, for watering trees that we can distribute in some colorful events to residents while educating them about um, climate change here in Brentwood Darlington. So that will be um, that will be a very positive event and maybe it will help us uh, forget about the ice storm and all the <clears throat> all the tree all the lost trees and tree branches that um, were due to the ice storm recently. And that's it for our agenda. Is there other business that any of you would like to raise? Uh, yes, Maria, go ahead. Once again, I'm coming without a solution, but I'm since we talked about the circuit week, what bothers me a little bit about it is that we're talking about climate change and um, doing you know the right thing for our environment, and then we buy a bulk buckets of plastic, and oh, I'm I just trying to think if there's anything else like could we recycle, you know, use something recycled, could we use milk jars, could you know? If I'm just I keep thinking about it, but I'm as I said, not coming up with a solution yet. This just seems um, kind of ironic to, you know, to to use plastic buckets that we buy. And then, I don't know, it just, it, it has bugged me from the very beginning. I love the soak it idea, but I just wish it wasn't, it wasn't pl um, plastic buckets. No, I I have wished also that that it weren't plastic. That, um, and I we can ask Trees for Life if, if there's an alternative and, and we will. And I don't know. I mean, we're <laughs> sorry. Part of the problem is that we're trapped in giant systems, and when we fight for to try to fight our way out, it's very difficult. I mean, there are families that have tried to live without plastic, and they they can't do it. You know, you just um, it we're it, it, it's really unfortunate that our species is just so. Yeah, but I mean, there is a lot of middle ground between completely not using plastic or consciously not, you know, try like in a situation like this, like, do we really need to buy 
all those plastic buckets or is there maybe especially this being an event where we want to pay attention to climate change and our trees mm -hmm. and you know is, is that maybe is there maybe and maybe there isn't but i would like just to see if somebody smarter than me comes up with a better idea or you know has some upcycling idea or i don't I, i'm well, we'll, uh, we'll ask Trees for Life. It may be that these buckets are all made from recycled plastic, which would be something anyway. Um, um, I'm, um, we'll, we'll find out. Yes, it bothers me. I don't know what to do about it, uh, but we'll ask them. I, it, it does bother me too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I keep thinking maybe I can <laughs> Okay, well, all right. Um, is there any other business then that anyone would like to bring up? Okay. All right, well, seeing that no one is bringing up other business, uh, then we will adjourn the meeting until April. I will send out the, um, the list of websites and access to our um, assessment and action plan that was done by PSU, um, I guess about three years, four years now um, ago. And, um, and we'll start educating ourselves about outreach. We'll do the best we can. Okay, well, good night, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, I'll see you all later. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Okay.